Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Good? You survived the rain, congratulations. So I look a little bit different uh, than the last time that I was up here. So six weeks ago, I went to Camp Paradise with my son. Let me hear it for all the dads who've gone to Camp Paradise before, right? If you've not been, Camp Paradise is our dad's camp. It's fantastic. And it's not the kind of place where you shave, just to let you know. So I came home from Camp Paradise and here we go. My wife looked at it and she goes, huh, keep it for a couple of days. It's been six weeks, so we'll see how long this lasts. But I think my favorite comment that that I've gotten about the beard so far, I've been surprised at the amount of white wisdom that is in the beard. And I was talking, we have a section that is, uh, these these are people who love to ride motorcycles, right? Many of you know about this section, yeah. And I was talking to the leader of this section, and he looked at me, he goes, Matt, I love the beard, and you got some chrome in it too, all right. So I've got some chrome in my beard, okay. (laughs) All right, well, before I worked at the church, before I worked at the church, I worked in the corporate world. I worked in the marketplace for several years. And don't get the wrong idea, I was insignificant peon in the corporate world for sure. And I was uh, in this developmental program where they would rotate us around different parts of the organization and we would do these rotations and get exposed to this part and then that part, so on and so forth. And one of my rotations was heavy into strategy work. I was the guy in the back who would take the notes during the strategy meetings while the grown-ups would develop strategy, right? And I would watch all these teams walk into these strategy meetings and they would roll their eyes thinking, oh man, it's another thousand hour strategy session talking about unrealistic goals that we're never going to accomplish that's just gonna end up in a binder on the shelf gathering dust until next year's meeting. Has anybody ever been a part of those meetings before? I love those meetings. I loved them. There was something about just thinking about possibilities and dreaming about vision and what if this and what if that. I loved it. And I loved the way we would think about how do we get to structure the organization to accomplish that vision. I loved it. There was something about it that just, that just made me come alive. And I would think about the stakes. Like if we don't do this, we're basically forfeiting the company that we could become. If we don't do this, we're forfeiting market share and all of that. And it was out of that job that God called me into the church as a worship leader, because that's a perfect fit, right? (laughs) But I was the worship leader who, in the meetings, was pushing us to think about the big picture, pushing us to think about vision and what's the strategy that we could could employ to accomplish that vision. And I started to realize something about myself. I can't stand it when organizations with a divine purpose aren't intentional about living it out. It makes me crazy when an organization has got a divine calling, but they can't get, they can't like seem to organize things enough to to live that out. And as high as the stakes are in the marketplace, think about the church. Is there an organization with a more high, more divine calling, with a bigger mission than the church? And as I leaned into that, I realized that this passion that I have isn't just for organizations, it's actually for people. My heart breaks for people who have a divine calling but struggle to live it out. My heart breaks for people who have divine potential but for whatever reason, they, they wander. For whatever reason, they can't turn it into action. And as high as the stakes are in an organization, or as high as the stakes are in a church, with people, these are divine stakes. Could it be any higher? And so I, I would see as I worked in this area, my passion would just increase. And, and I would get energy and I would, I would come alive. I would, I would go home and tell my wife when I got to work in that area, I, I think I was made for this. I think this might be like why God put me together. Maybe this is my purpose, is to help people discover their divine potential and live it out. Have you ever known somebody that you look at them and you can just see huge potential in their life, but for whatever reason, they struggle to turn that potential into action? 
You ever known somebody where you, maybe it's a friend or maybe it's a coworker, but you see them, they've got so many gifts, but, but maybe it's bad habits. Maybe it's that they, they allow themselves to invest in areas that just don't line up with their giftings and they struggle to live it out. Have you ever known somebody like that? It's hard when we see that in a friend. It's tragic when we see that in a family member. If it's a sibling or a son or daughter, and it can be absolutely crushing when we feel it in ourself. Maybe as you hear that, you say, that's me. I know what it's like to come home and rather than say to your spouse, I feel like I was made for this, to say for your spouse, say to your spouse, I'm not in a place that aligns with how God put me together. I know what that's like. I know how hard that can be. I know what it's like to even wonder does God have a divine potential for me? I just want to remind anybody who can hear my voice right now, God has a divine potential for you. He has a divine purpose for you. He put that divine potential inside of you. It's there because he put it there. You are like dynamite. You have exponential, explosive potential. And in the right surrounding, in the right context, God can light the fuse of your life and use you to literally move mountains. He can use you to have a shocking impact on this world. You have purpose. And you have potential. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We're gonna open up the scriptures to Ephesians chapter two and dive in and see God's purpose and potential for your life. So if you brought your Bible with you, would you please open it up to Ephesians chapter two? We're gonna be looking at verses four through 10. Ephesians chapter two, verses four through 10. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. Starting in verse four, it says this. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So today, we're going to look at this passage verse by verse. We're going to dive deep into this passage that really teaches us foundations of our faith. It teaches us the foundations of our salvation. And as we do it, we're going to explore the purpose and the potential that God put in us. Are you, are you game? You willing to go deep with us today? Yeah? All right, all right. Let's pray together and we'll dive in, okay? God, huh. I pray that as we open up your word today, you would speak to our hearts. Lord, help us to hear from you. Would you open up our eyes to the purpose and the potential that you have for our lives? We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right, so we're gonna look verse by verse here. Let's start off in verse four and look for purpose and potential. Paul starts off with this. Because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, It is by grace you have been saved. So the sentence structure here can be a little bit cumbersome. So I want to just help you zoom in to the center of what Paul is communicating here. And it's this, God, the same God who is rich in mercy, God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. See the contrast between alive and dead. Oftentimes it's tempting for us to think that that maybe spiritually speaking, before we found God, we were just in a really, really dark place. We were just really, really struggling. We weren't really dead. We were just really, really struggling. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says, you and I spiritually were totally, completely dead. 
Dead in our transgressions, dead in our wrongdoings, we were hopeless. There was no hope whatsoever. We were dead, all the way dead. And God, because of Jesus, God made us alive in Christ. And why did he do it? There's this idea that maybe we weren't totally dead. Maybe we were just struggling. And as we were struggling, we we started to try and put ourselves back together. We started to try and do more good stuff than bad stuff. We started to maybe serve God a little bit and say, God, I love you. And then, then God saw us and had compassion on us, reached down and picked us the rest of the way up. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says it doesn't start with your love for God. It doesn't start with your service for God. In fact, the reason that God saved us is right here, because of his great love for us. It doesn't say because of your great love for God, God made you alive with Christ. It doesn't say that, does it? It says because of God's love for you. See, you didn't love God and then God responded with his love for you. It's the other way around. God loved you. And then you responded with your love of God, for it is by grace you have been saved. Only by grace you have been saved. Paul says, before we talk about purpose and potential, you need to understand the core of the gospel. And the core of the gospel is this, Jesus died for your wrongdoing, for your transgressions. Jesus invites us to allow his sacrifice on the cross to apply to our life. And his resurrection can guarantee us eternal life with God. But all of this is for one purpose. And you know what that purpose is? It's not about your love for him. It's not about your service for him. Paul says, this is the purpose. This is the reason why God chose to save you this way. Here's the purpose in the next verse. Paul says this, he did it this way in order that, so that in the coming ages, even right now, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. See, Paul wants you to know that salvation this way is only because of God and it's only for God. It's all about God displaying his grace to the entire world. That's why he chose to save us, save us this way so that the whole world could see how good he is. He did this to bring glory to himself. See, if we're not careful, we might have this idea that, that we are the center of the world, right? Right? That salvation is all about us. It's all about how much we served God. It's all about how much we loved God. And, and when it comes down to it, it's our actions, it's our responses, it's our, it's, it's, it's our ownership that actually uh, impacts salvation. But God is saying, no, salvation is all about me. And it's all about me showing my grace and my kindness to the entire world. It's all about me. And Paul says, look, if you didn't catch this the first time, let me be even more specific. In the next verse, Paul says this, for it is by what? Say it again. For it is by grace that you have been saved. Grace. Through faith. And this faith, this is not from yourselves. This is shocking to me. Paul is saying even the faith that you have inside of you, even that ability to believe who God is, that doesn't even come from yourself. Even that faith is a gift of God. It is not about your works so that nobody can boast. If it was about your works for God, then you could boast. Then you could say, I'm saved because of what I did. If it was about your love for God, then you could boast. You could say, I'm saved because I love God. Paul is saying, "Uh uh-uh. It's not about your works. It's not about your love. It's only about his work. It's only about his love because it's only about his glory and his grace. Let's zoom this into our life. Me, I'm not saved because I love everyone always. That doesn't save me. I'm not saved because I try to be a good dad to my kids, and I really want to be a good dad to my kids. I'm not saved because I try to be a good husband to my wife, and I want to do that well. You and me were not saved because we give our income to the church. 
We wouldn't be saved if we sold everything and gave it all to the poor. It wouldn't be enough. You aren't saved because you go to church three times a week, 52 weeks a year. It doesn't save you. You aren't saved if you serve in our kids' ministry or if you lead a student small group. You aren't saved for serving the poor. Your good works might make the world a better place, but your good works don't earn you a better place with God. Let me say that again. Your good works might make the world a better place, but your good works don't earn you a better place with God. Your actions can't inspire God's affection because he already loves you. He already loves you before the actions. Your serving doesn't earn your salvation. We're saved because of what he did, not what we did. We're saved because of his love, not our love. And we're saved that way because it brings him glory, not our glory. You are saved because of the work of God's hands. And you are the work of God's hands. Now, I know we're in the weeds a little bit here, right? We're, we're in the details of this passage, but we're going somewhere, I promise. So stick with me. We're the work of God's hands. In the next verse, this is what Paul says. For we are God's handiwork. That word handiwork is funny to me. Uh, when I was a kid, we lived in Houston. I grew up in the Houston area. And we would take road trips from Houston all the way up to Salt Lake City, which is where I have extended family. And, you know, this is in the era before video games and movies in the car. So my parents were always trying to do things to help entertain us. Anybody remember those magnetic checker games in the car? You guys remember those? Yeah? Uh, do you guys remember the alphabet game where you'd look at license plates and signs and try to get the alphabet? Uh, one year on this road trip, my parents threw all kinds of arts and crafts at us. We would have these great big long streams of, of like plastic and they'd give us a key ring and you would take these plastic pieces and weave them around the key ring to make a keychain. It was called a boondoggle keychain. Does anybody remember boondoggle keychain? Hey, does anybody have boondoggle keychain? No, all right. When I see the word handiwork, I think boondoggle keychain made by a six-year-old. When I see the word handiwork, you remember those pot holders that preschoolers make for moms on Mother's Day? Handiwork. When I see handiwork, I think of something you do in your basement and sell at an art fair, at a craft fair. I think of something that's sentimental, but not valuable, not necessarily beautiful. But remember, today we're talking about purpose and potential. Paul is teaching something incredibly beautiful, incredibly deep about your purpose in this. See, the original language here is Greek, right? And the word for handiwork in the Greek is the word poema. Poema. Can you say that with me? Poema. The word poema, literally translated, means this. Something crafted with masterful creativity. You couldn't be further away from potholders and boondoggle. This is a work of art. This is a masterpiece. In fact, poema is where we get the English word for poem. Can you see it? It's where we get the word for poetry. So you could take Ephesians 2.10 and you could translate it this way. Instead of for we are God's handiwork, you could say for we are God's poem. You are God's poem created in Christ Jesus. You are spoken into existence by Christ Jesus himself as his artwork. The very poetry of God. So I, I love poetry, which I know some of you might roll your eyes at, and that's okay. You're allowed. I love poetry. There's something about just the intentionality behind it, the way that every word is painstakingly selected. I love the intentionality of when it rhymes beautifully and the intentionality of when sometimes it doesn't rhyme. I love that the purpose of poetry is, is to communicate the heart of the poet. The purpose of poetry communicates emotion, the intention of the poet, the deep truth. Poetry forces, forces us to slow down 
It forces us to ask the big questions about life and look deeper. Poetry shows the heart of the poet. And the genius of poetry isn't just the words themselves. The genius of poetry is in the poet who arranges those words just so. You are divine poetry. Spoken into existence by Christ Jesus himself. You are divine poetry. And if I look at your life, there would be places where your life rhymes and it makes sense and it's intentional. And there are places of your life that don't rhyme, but they're equally intentional. Everything about you is painstakingly selected by the master artist. Your life has verse and refrain to tell the story of God, to show the glory of who he is and how he formed you. You are the poetry of God. Your life is meant to slow people down, to make them ask the big questions about life. The poem of your life is meant to point people toward the poet. You want to know what your purpose is? Is to be the poetry of God. Your purpose is to point people toward the poet. That's why we exist. And you don't try to be a poem of God. You just are. Because that's what he created you to be. That's what he spoke you into existence to be. You just are his poetry. And every day we submit ourselves more and more and more to the master and we say, God, would you mold me into the masterpiece that you want my life to be? You were crafted to be divine poetry and you have divine potential. Let's look at the rest of this verse and watch for your divine potential. Paul says, for we are God's poem created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Did you see the divine potential? You were created to do good works. To do. You were created to do. See the big picture of this whole passage because it's important to see it all in context. You were saved because of God's love for you, not your love for God. Your, your actions don't inspire God's affections. You were saved because of God's work for you, not your work for God. Your serving can't earn your salvation. And yet you were God's poetry and your purpose is to do. You're not saved because of what you did, but when you're saved, you're saved to do. You're not saved because of how you serve, but we are saved to serve. It's our divine purpose with divine potential. Your purpose is to be dynamite in this world. You're saved to do good works. You're saved to say, God, put me in the right place where you can light the fuse of my life and move mountains with me. Put me in the right place where you can light the fuse of my life and light up the world. I love that this passage says that God prepared in advance these places for us to serve. There are places, ministries, there are careers. There are places that are specifically designed for the works of your hands that fit you perfectly, hand in glove, because God prepared those places in advance. It's how he wants you to serve. It's how he wants to show his character to the world. You're not loved, you're not saved because of how you serve, but you are saved to serve. You are saved to serve, created to do, created to serve. Created to serve God in two ways, in our whole life and in our everyday life. Created to serve God in the grand and created to serve God in the mundane. You look at Jesus's life. The life of Jesus had a very clear, specific purpose. Everything that Jesus did pointed to the cross. It pointed to the resurrection, and it pointed to the redemption for all mankind. Everything that he did, every conversation that he was in, pointed toward that. The teaching, the miracles, how he spent every day pointed toward that overall purpose. That's how God, that's how Jesus served God with his whole life. It was his overarching purpose. And you and I are invited to discover that overarching purpose for our whole life, to serve God with our whole life. And what that looks like for us is, is to dive deep and say, God, how did you create me? Would you mold me every day into the masterpiece that you want me to be? Is to seek hard after God and say, Lord, put me in the place where my divine potential can be lived out. I don't wanna waste one more day 
in a career that doesn't match the divine poetry that you put inside me. I'm not gonna waste one more day away from where you wanna light my fuse and move mountains with me. God, I wanna go all in. And that is exciting. It's exciting to say, take my life. I wanna go all in and I wanna serve you on the grand scale with my whole life. But Jesus also served God in the everyday. He also served God's in, God in ways that, that we might see as mundane. Jesus served God by serving the people that God had put in front of him every day. Jesus' life in the Gospels, you see, was incredibly interruptible. He served in the minute. He was constantly watching for the small-scale serve. He was washing feet, small-scale serve to us. He was holding babies. Maybe it looks like a small-scale serve. Blessing kids. I, I, I look at that and I have a problem because for me, it's, it's oftentimes less, I don't know, exciting to serve in the everyday than it is to think about how can I serve God with my whole life. I don't know if you relate to any of these things, but sometimes serving God in the everyday can feel mundane. You, you can say, yeah, I, I'm just not sure that this, that this fits my passion. I don't know if this fits my, my overall gifting. I don't get really excited for this. And then sometimes in our dark moments, we can even say, I, maybe I'm in too big of a position for that serve. Maybe that's not a good serve for me. I'm just curious, and this is what's convicting to me. When Jesus washed feet, do you think he thought to himself, man, this is an exciting surf. Boy, this matches my passion and my giftings perfectly. There's nothing that I could be doing that would be better than this right now. I get so much out of this surf. It's awesome. I don't think so. I think when Jesus washed feet, it was gross. I don't think it smelled very good. I don't think it was something that was comfortable. I don't know that Jesus would say, I really got something out of that serve. Jesus served God in the everyday and the mundane because it's what God called him to do. And he served God with it. I don't mean to step on your toes too much here, but, but the word Christian literally means little uh, people who look like Jesus, like little Jesus is running around, right? If we wanna be called Christians, that means we have to do what Jesus did. Jesus didn't just serve God in the grand. He didn't just serve God with his whole life. He also served God with his everyday life and the mundane. And if we want to wear the title of Christian, we have to serve. We have to serve the people that God puts in front of us every day. We have to be faithful in our everyday lives to look around and say, who needs to have their feet washed today? What are the needs that God is putting in front of me today, even if it feels small, small scale? We can't expect for God to open the doors of grand scale serving God with our whole life if we're not faithful with serving God on the small scale, if we're not faithful to serve God every day with the people that he puts in front of our lives today. Uh, the service, or the series rather, that we're in right now is called We Are Here. And we're capping up our third week of talking about serving. And part of what we're hoping to do with this series is to just call out the reality of where we are as a church. We are here. So let's talk about where are we as a church when it comes to serving. The reality is, at Willow, our value of serving has been sliding just a little bit. We're not where we were in the past when it comes to serving. We have huge needs in every ministry. And I think we all know that our church won't function to our God-given potential unless we all dive in and serve. When you serve people right in front of you, you might find your passion for life or you might just find that you are needed. But either way, you're gonna find that this is what God created us to do. I've got a friend who saw that we had a need for a second grade boys small group leader. Wasn't necessarily passionate about it, but said, there's a need. And this is what it means for me to serve the people that are right in front of me today. Fast forward two years later, he loves it. This is a part of his calling. This is a part of what he's here to do. He realized that serving these kids was a part of him discovering his whole life purpose. I've got another friend who's a lawyer, legal profession by trade. And she saw that there was a need in our care center for more people to volunteer their hours to offer free legal services to people in our care center. 
And as she served there, God totally rearranged her life. Got another friend uh, who, who uh, has a background in law enforcement. And he saw that we had a need to, to, for people to help keep our church safe. And he's like, yeah, I'm retired, but this is a way that I can serve. And it's helping the needs right in front of him today. Listen, you and I were created as divine poetry with divine potential. We were created to serve, to serve God with our whole life and to serve God with our everyday life. So I'm gonna wrap this up. Wrap this up and, and maybe bring some application to our lives today. Here's the big picture. The big picture is that you and I were saved because God loved us, not because we love God. Our actions don't inspire his affections. He loved us first. We are saved because of God's service for us, not the way that we serve God. Our serving doesn't earn our salvation. And yet, God created us to be divine poetry with divine potential, and we only see that potential when we serve. You and me were created to serve in our whole life and created to serve in our everyday life. So as we close, I just have a few questions I'd like to ask you. First question, are you serving God with your whole life? Do you know the divine poetry that God has put inside of you? Do you know the divine potential that he has for you? Are you studying how he created you? Looking at the gifts, the spiritual gifts, the passions, the talents, the circumstances, the education, the environments that he puts you in. Are you saying, God, I am willing, I am all in. Place me where you want to place me. Light my fuse and move mountains with my life. Maybe the Holy Spirit is working in you today to say it's time for me to go all in and serve God with my whole life. Maybe that's how God's speaking to you today. Second question, are you serving God in your everyday life? Are you serving the people that God put in front of you today as you think back over this weekend? Can you think of times that you have washed the feet of the people around you this weekend? Are you constantly looking around, seeing who might need to be served that God is putting in your path? Are you serving in the ways that might even feel mundane? Maybe your takeaway today is to choose to serve God in your everyday life, to obey Jesus, to be like him, and to serve the people that God puts in front of you today. The third question. Maybe as you hear statements like, your actions can't earn God's affections, or statements like, your serving can't earn your salvation, you realize that you've been trying to earn God's love this whole time and you've never just accepted it. Maybe what you need to do today is to say, God, I accept your love. I accept your salvation and I'm not gonna try to earn it anymore. My friends, you and I are divine poetry with divine potential created to serve we are never more alive, never more who God created us to be than when we are serving. So may we live a life of service in our whole life and in our everyday life because we were made for this. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and we'll close our service today. So two next steps. First next step. If you'd like to learn more about this divine poetry that God put inside you, if you'd like to learn more about the, the idea about spiritual gifts and the way God shaped you, this coming Wednesday at our midweek service, I'm going to be teaching specifically about the concept of spiritual gifts. And I'm gonna give you some tools that you can use to learn more about how God created you. So if you wanna go deeper in that, I encourage you, join me this coming Wednesday night at our midweek service. On the other side, if the Holy Spirit is whispering to you about serving in the everyday, we have needs all over our church. And as you've heard, we've got this thing called See the Serve for the next two weeks to give you a firsthand opportunity to experience what it's like to serve here. 
from our care center to our kids' ministry, from guest experience to student ministries, all over, over 100 different opportunities. I hope, my, my hope, my prayer, is that 100% of our church would try out serving over the next two weeks. That not one of us would say, nah, I don't wanna do that. That's my hope. For you to learn more, you can go on the app, you can go on the website, or maybe the best bet is in Guest Central right after the service. We have serving coaches in there, and they would love to just talk with you, hear about your life, hear about the areas of passion, maybe tell you about the areas that we have need, and you can learn more right there. Either way, my prayer is that we can live out this whole life of service. So we're gonna close, and I'd love to give you a blessing. So would you please hold out a blessing, or hold out your hands, and I'll bless you today. Willow Creek Community Church. May you remember that you were loved first. May you remember that you were served first. May you remember that you are divine poetry created with divine potential. May you know that you are never more of who God wants you to be than when you serve. And this week, may you serve God with your whole life and serve God with your everyday life. I bless you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Blessings, everybody. Have a great day.